Welcome to The Lead from New Lines Magazine. I'm Faisal Yafai, and this is a podcast where we delve into the biggest ideas, events, and personalities from around the world. Obviously, the war in Iraq was a big fat mistake, said the then presidential candidate Donald Trump in 2016. Today, that's more or less the consensus position, no matter your political persuasion. Those who do still defend the invasion seldom do so without emphatic caveat, and they prefer to mumble rather than shout about it. But before the rise of Trump, the Republicans had mostly held the party line on the war in Iraq. Interventionism versus isolationism is a question that's dogged American political life since at least the Spanish-American War of 1898. The reluctant involvement of the United States in the two world wars played a big part in convincing Americans of the necessity of military engagement. But it was the Cold War which really normalized the idea of American military power as an ever-present. After the fall of the Soviet Union, this enthusiasm showed little sign of abating. The 1990s saw a series of ostensibly humanitarian interventions in countries like Bosnia, Kosovo, and Sierra Leone. It's only since the invasion of Iraq, 20 years ago this month, that Americans have gradually begun to fall out of love with interventionism once more. A few weeks ago, we spoke to David French about the battle for American conservatism as part of a series of episodes exploring the intellectual fault lines of modern American politics. Today, we'll be unpacking the ideas underpinning both isolationism and interventionism across the political spectrum. To do so, I'm joined by Samuel Moyne, a professor of law and history at Yale University and the author of Humane, How the United States Abandoned Peace and Reinvented War. He's also a fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, a cross-partisan think tank urging restraint in U.S. foreign policy. Sam, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. So as we said in the introduction, America has been having these debates about interventionism and isolationism for at least the past hundred years or so. But we're kind of at an interesting moment right now where the pendulum seems to be the tipping point between the two. Is that a a fair way to start the conversation? I think so. I mean, uh, if you're on the left like me, you you resist the word isolationism altogether because we could be talking about different forms of internationalism uh, focused on military intervention or not, rather Mm. than intervention as such versus isolation or standoffishness from the world. And I would have said the most interesting moment in in this debate was actually the very brief period in between current President Joe Biden's decision to withdraw from Afghanistan and the beginning of the Ukraine war. Okay. But you're right, we're at we're definitely in an interesting moment uh, in the last few years. So you think just in the past two years, there's been a a recalibration of where the intellectual argument is based on those two events, the withdrawal from Afghanistan and then the invasion of Ukraine? I think so. Really, since Barack Obama's run for presidency, the, the military interventionist argument has been weakening to the point of collapse and that the Afghan withdrawal really capped that long phase. And I think interventionists have been given a lot of new support by the Ukraine war, but I don't think we've returned to the Cold War period when, as you said, it was just a default that Americans intervened anywhere for any reason. Yeah. And so I want to come to some of that, but I I suppose I want to understand where you are on the political spectrum, because you started by saying you wouldn't put yourself as an isolationist. You would say you're you agree with intervention, but in different forms to military intervention. I would call myself a progressive internationalist, which means that we shouldn't live in a world of nation states. uh, And therefore, it's it's not just about restraining military power so that armies and you know weapons uh stay within state borders it's about constructing a better international order in part to restrain great powers that are interventionist in military terms so uh if you're uh, uh, on the left i think you resist the idea when you call for less war that you're committed to isolationism you might be committed to a better internationalism so you might try to construct or you believe that americans ought to be involved in constructing a version of the world that would then restrain the own impulses of people like john bolton and so on Uh, and vladimir putin and you know the big opportunity on that 
story w- was missed in the construction of the United Nations, which basically leaves great powers immune from the constraints uh, on war making that all the rest of the states in the world have to live with. Those great right. powers prominently include Russia and the United States. And in those situations, because, of course, Russia sits on the Security Council, the only way to restrain a country like Russia is through the use of force, as we're seeing now. Correct. So I wanted to start talking a bit about your personal views on this, because the way that your views have changed over the past couple of decades, I think, is similar to how many Americans have changed their perspective. So when you came of age in the 1990s, you were an interventionist. In fact, you were working for the Clinton White House during the intervention in Bosnia. Exactly. You know, when when I was in my 20s, um, it was after 1989. And uh, it it seemed as if we we lived through the end of history, as Francis Fukuyama told us, and all that remained was to spread human rights to places where they had not yet been institutionalized and, you know, potentially uh, not just aid uh victims of crimes against humanity and genocide through bombing, as in the Kosovo campaign you mentioned, but even overthrow despots who were the kind of last obstructions to a universal uh, reign of human rights uh, in a unipolar world. And that was incredibly appealing to lots of Americans, especially young people like me. And then you went through a transition or you had a stark realization. What changed your mind? It was a series of steps, um, but I think it wasn't just the Iraq war, uh, which showed where good intentions leave lead, but uh, uh, other great power wars. I mean, uh, in his rant before invading Ukraine, Vladimir Putin cited Kosovo as a precedent. Uh, for mm-hmm. his own allegedly humanitarian intervention. Uh, and uh, then there were other events like uh, the overthrow uh, of Muammar Gaddafi in Libya in 2011, in which the best interventionist intentions uh, paved the road to hell. And so uh, I, I began to conclude that maybe great powers using force for a good cause, allegedly, um, always made the world not better, but worse, and that we needed to think about a new form of internationalism than the one I'd grown up believing in. I mean, that's, I think, part of your your thinking now, that you seem incredibly skeptical about the idea that any of the justifications for intervention can in any way be true. I think so. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. there's in theory, you have to acknowledge a case for just war, and you can sometimes find examples in practice. Uh, even humanitarian intervention by great powers can make the world a better place, but it's almost it almost never does. An example would be uh, Obama's decision to uh, briefly protect the Yazidi people uh, from extermination when they were caught on a mountaintop. Uh, but that's, you know, brief and surgical and it, it's, it's localized and it's not as if it, it, that kind of view should lead us to think that, um, it's going to work out regularly. In fact, it's the other way around that almost always military intervention makes the world worse. And once you learn that lesson, you begin to not embrace isolationism, but long for some way of controlling the interventionist, especially when uh, there's no legal constraint on them through the United Nations because they have a veto. Do you think, if we're talking about, for example, the Yazidi protection, the pinpoint strikes and so on, do you think that there is a justification for things like that, but not a justification, for example, for Libya? I think so, but then we'd have to delve into um, why is it why is it defensible? So there you could argue that in the Libyan case, uh, when uh, Gaddafi, you know, did say things that implied he would exterminate the stalwart, uh, uh, you know, 
insurrectionaries of, of, of Benghazi like insects or vermin. Yeah. Um, well, why not just protect them for as long as it takes? Um, well, for one thing, it would be permanent. And second, we saw how that limited humanitarian rationale, which the United Nations Security Council did approve, uh, quickly devolved into regime change. So we'd have to get just very clear about what separates a situation in which you can engage in brief uh, and local defense of a people from kind of permanent protection and yeah. regime change to make it uh, unnecessary. But this is one of the things I think is fascinating about the, the, your thought process because it's politically complex. You're, it's, and it's also very difficult to sell in some ways because those people like John Bolton who want to intervene everywhere, always, all at once, and those people who say never intervene, those two groups of people find it politically easier to explain to the public their views. True. Whereas your position is much more complex and it's determined by the specific facts, specific context, the particular political moment. I think that's right. I mean, I, I think that um, I, I do side mostly with the non-interventionists just because it's very hard to find uh, examples in which a military intervention improves things, uh, mm. in, including military intervention. So to acknowledge the theoretical case for just war, to distinguish myself from pacifism, really doesn't make that much difference in practice because the cases in which I'm going to side with the interventionists are going to be extremely few and very far between. I want to read one more quote about your, your previous self, because I think it's a good quote. This was from a profile in the Chronicle of Higher Education. And you were saying, you were talking about your time in the White House. And you said, this is a quote, um, I thought I was serving humanity, but I was serving what in retrospect has to be seen as an assertion of American hegemony. Can you talk a bit about what you mean by that? So a, a lot of people who I think prematurely embraced cosmopolitan views, universalist views, human rights, humanitarian intervention, et cetera, really concealed from themselves that they could embrace those things in a universe, in a unipolar world in which America was the leading power. And that meant uh, uh, not just letting America itself off the leash militarily so that it continue it could continue its Cold War practice of direct intervention, proxy war, uh, not to mention supervising uh, the arms trade, uh, which is you know humongous. Yeah. Uh, this is another uh, crucial part of your your thought process that you yeah. you contend but, that America yeah but 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 just concealing. America's role in the world, which is not the the role that a genuine cosmopolitan power would play. And so I think a lot of us made a big mistake in identifying America with humanity. Mm. So that seems like a good moment to talk about the neoconservative movement, because the reason I thought that quote was so interesting is that it highlights a distinction that I think has been somewhat lost between neoconservatives and center-left liberal interventionists like your younger self. Because to some degree, they learned to speak the same language of human rights in the 1990s. And there's some overlap between the two. But it's telling that you came to see the conclusion, you came to see that the assertion of American hegemony was not synonymous with the wider good for humanity. Whereas I think for the neocons, that's the whole point of the premise. Exactly. Uh, and, and they have really not abandoned that premise to this day that. Uh, it's not that there aren't cosmopolitan or universal values, but there's no reason uh, to doubt that America is their steward um, and that mm -hmm. therefore American power is the linchpin of the f cause of humanity. And this is really important because while I abandon uh, you know, my liberal internationalism of the 1990s pretty quickly, a lot of liberals share those beliefs with neocons and they did things like decry the Iraq war, you know, hmm. within a, a couple of years because of the torture and, and so forth. But they embraced American power in Obama's administration 
And that meant that it wasn't just neocons, but their seeming foes in American political debate who yeah. adopt a, a, a neoconservative structure of thought, which is what led to Libya, not to mention the reinvention of the war on terror under liberal auspices when Obama was in power with the rise of drone warfare, the extraordinary escalation of use of special forces uh, to patrol the world. So it's really important to see how mainstream these neoconservative premises have been and how it went, what we called interventionism at the start of this conversation yeah. uh, is really neoconservatism by another name, even for those who purport to have abandoned uh, it or opposed it. And let's unpack what you were saying about the Obama years a little bit, because your contention is that this war on terror neoconservative idea starts in 2001. But then once Obama comes into power, you believe the same premise continued, but under a liberal president. I think that's right. I mean, there was much less talk about advancing the interests of humanity in overthrowing despots, although in the end, because of pressure from advisors of his like Samantha Power and Susan Rice, Obama did assent to the overthrow of Gaddafi with all the terrible consequences that had. But um, from his own perspective, uh, having run as an anti-war candidate, he nonetheless chose in his first year in office to really reinvent the war on terror, taking it to many new countries uh, and adopting a, a kind of strategy of withdrawing troops uh, from Afghanistan um, after a so-called surge, uh, and especially Iraq, while uh, uh, escalating the war on terror through armed drones and special forces, which ended up killing in many more countries than under the neocons mm. of the George W. Bush years. So there's a way in which Obama actually expanded the neoconservative war on terror, uh, although he dropped the kind of cosmopolitan rationale that the neocons sometimes use that they were, you know, protecting human rights or spreading democracy in the process. Mm. I mean, this podcast is really meant to be about the fault lines in American political life. And I think one of the hardest questions for non-interventionists of the past 10 years is the Syria war. Now, we've talked a little bit about the Libyan conflict, and your contention is that there were other ways to solve it, other ways to protect the people of Benghazi rather than um, uh, a direct military intervention. Well, let's talk about Syria, because Syria very much came about in the context of Iraq. And so there was a lot of pressure to intervene and a lot of pressure not to have a second Iraq. Where to, Let's go back to 2011 when you know the, the Syrian uprising turns into a bloodbath from the regime. Where were you at that point and have you changed your mind subsequently? Well, no, by that point, I was a staunch uh, non-interventionist, not believing in the progressive uses of military force. And I still am, uh, mm. notwithstanding the seeming costs of that position in the face of the Syrian bloodbath. And uh, I, I guess I, I'll explain, you know, why I've re kind of remained stuck in my position, you know, Please, yeah. because the, I think there, there are two things to say. First, um, the, the Iraq war um, is you know, a, a kind of noxious gift that, that kept on giving. It wasn't just the carnage to which it led in uh, Iraq itself that made many of us so upset, but just the, the regional destabilization. Uh, and um, it is, it's, it's, it's not as if you just want to, you know, make a simple claim like, absent the Iraq war, no Syrian carnage. But we, we just have to remember that you have to own all the risks that you court in any intervention. And some of them could be uh, 
you know, regional and long term, not just short term and local. But then you get to, um, you know, the 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 thought that it's it's just there's tragedy, uh, and there are some situations in which there are no good options, um, and that that make that is really hard because we can see that. Um, Syria was a, a place in which um, Putin uh, in, in intervened and, you know, set up a, a, a kind of, um, you know, uh, his own kind of like, you know, global designs ran through the, the Syrian civil war in ways that, you know, should really disturb us. And mm -hmm. for many, I think at the time and, and, and since, you know, M might have required an answer and yet i i think there are, there are some situations maybe many in which we just don't have credible tools to improve the world even in the face of horrendous suffering and so i think we're in a period in which cosmopolitans and liberals have to own that they've often worsened the world through military intervention and don't yet have all that good remedies in some situations for making it better. And that's just kind of a hard thing to acknowledge that uh, at times we're powerless uh, except to make things worse. And that's the situation we're in. That's why I think maybe we should respond to a tragedy like the Syrian one by trying to think about what, what better tools we can imagine in a long term constructing a better United Nations, figuring out how to transcend the, the current order of nation states, which does allow um, for the kinds of atrocities that a lot of us do imagine, uh, you know, containing or preventing in some future world order. I'm going to push you a little bit on this because the, the language of a tragedy is very passive. The Syrian yes. civil war wasn't a tragedy like, you know, like the earthquake recently in Turkey. Of course. This was a political project that other political actors like the United States could have had an effect on. Of course. So you would have, even under those circumstances, even accepting that perspective, you would have said, we still need to let it burn itself out and not be involved. So by tragedy, I just mean that in life, there are situations where there are no good answers. And that's not to deflect blame from Assad or Putin or whomever. Hmm. Uh, and indeed, if we conclude that America or someone should have acted, it's not to deflect blame from the inaction. Now, I still defend that inaction um, because uh, first, um, th America did some things. Uh, let's not forget that. And, you know, some people actually take the position that the trouble in Syria was not inaction, but um, the amount of arms that uh, were pumped into the country. Um, but it, if you think that the trouble was not enough intervention by America or the West, you have to have a really believable view that um, more militarism would have improved the situation and mm -hmm. we're we're facing that same situation now in ukraine yes. where we could imagine sending arms to our allies uh against uh our opponents for as long into the future as as you like yeah and it is not obvious that doing so makes the world better it seems like it could be a recipe for continuing horror well, and fact so i I'm not sure that there's a very realistic case that America could have done something different than it did. In Syria. In Syria. Mm. In Ukraine in particular, it isn't merely that people talk about continuing to offer weapons and bigger weapons and fighter jets and so on. It's that the terms of the battlefield also keep expanding. I mean, you hear people, I don't know if you put them in the neocon category, but talking about we need to hit Crimea, we need to take that part back. The battlefield just keeps getting wider. That's right. You know, the temptation to, uh, to escalate has been there from the earliest days. That was in uh, talks 
uh, actually Volodymyr Zelensky's open invitation of air power to establish no fly zones. Uh, Joe Biden rejected that, but you know he's someone uh, like Obama in a certain way in the past in Syria who has chosen a certain amount of interventionism to avoid excessive escalation. Um, and then we're in the you know expected debate. Is there too much interventionism or too little? Yeah. Um, now, my own view is that uh, we have to try to understand, um, you know, what, once again, as with Syria, why did this war come about? What were the prior conditions, including in Western policy choices that led to it? And then from the earliest days of the war, it seems like there is a compromise available, um, especially given Russian control of a lot of territory in eastern Ukraine. And there's a bargain to be made. And the question is, is it going to be made sooner rather than later? And the only way to refute that position is to say, that the current amount of assistance or even greater assistance to Ukraine by the West would lead to some decisive military advance. And so yeah. far, we're not seeing it, just as we're not seeing Putin get some kind of decisive military advance from his perspective. So we're in a quagmire, and the only question is how long we live with it. I want to talk about the like the intellectual themes because the the Russian invasion of Ukraine has definitely reinvigorated. I guess you could call them neocons, but it's interesting about the the way people talk. People like Robert Kagan, Max Boot, David Trump. They now talk about the liberal international order when it comes to Ukraine, and the the that's very different rhetoric from what we were hearing in the early days of the war on terror. But it feels to me like you're saying that actually we end up in the very same place. Well, I think we're on the neoconservative spectrum, but it it's it's been very interesting to see some neocons um, repentant and others more interested in extenuating their old mistakes, acknowledging but them, but put them in context. I'd cite uh, you know David Frum, who wrote a piece in the Atlantic a few days ago, deeply involved in the coming of the Iraq War. The someone who coined the phrase, the axis of evil, evil who, um, you know, acknowledged that Iraq was a disaster, but then kind of tried to contextualize the mistake as not that horrendous after all. And in, in the Ukraine situation, I, I wouldn't say we're seeing neoconservatism triumphant, although certain neocons have said that, you know, the fact that Putin is an aggressive, evil character just vindicates the need for American power. Mm -hmm. um, but you are seeing liberals embrace American military intervention uh, along neoconservative lines, approximately in the same spirit uh, as before. And so this moment, this kind of more interesting moment between the Afghan withdrawal and the Ukraine war, I think is being eroded, let's put it that way, by a return of some of the neoconservative sentiment that, you know, prevailed in the past. We're not anywhere near, you know, to 2003 when like literally the most Americans embrace neoconservatism and yeah. it, it's it's wars, but we're, we're heading backwards into that past just as we were at the moment of extricating ourselves from it. Do you see a resurgence among liberals of what used to be called muscular liberalism? These are the people who were liberals ostensibly, but they were cheerleading for the war in Iraq. Do you see their return now with the war in Ukraine? To an extent. I mean, I think um, some, of the, some of those characters um, uh, have died or retired. Um, uh, others, younger ones, uh, uh, have have really changed their perspective um, and their their organs like the New Republic magazine famously yeah. have really, you know, they've lost control of those. But uh, then you look at um, the new crop of interventionists uh, and uh, those on the progressive left who really feel that, 
progressive internationalism has to take military form in a world of evildoers like Putin. And the Atlantic magazine uh, is, you know, playing the role that the New Republic used to play. So I think that though the characters are different and the the form of neoconservatism is not um, as, let's say, um, you know, uh, triumphant as it was in 2003, we're seeing, uh, you know, approximately the same kinds of sentiments um, reinstitutionalized in the era of the Ukraine war. How do you explain the liberals who are in favor of the the extension of the war in Ukraine? Previously, I think you would have called them neoconservative tailcoat riders, like right. with the war in Iraq. But now it seems like you're saying there's a new ideology emerging on the left and it's representative in the war in Ukraine. Is that right? And if it is, perhaps just expand on it so we see that we delineate the differences. So I think um, the 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 era of the Iraq War was distinctive in a few ways, and and one one way it was distinctive was what you could call the long legacy of George McGovern, who was famously the a Democratic presidential standard bearer after the Vietnam War who lost badly to Richard Nixon because Mm -hmm. he was seen to be weak on American nationalism and militarism. And the Democrats really for decades learned the lesson from that experience that they should always, you know, um, rattle the saber and um, adapt to the militarism and nationalism that they attribute to the American public. And right. that's why liberals were so gung-ho in in the Iraq war, because they didn't want to be seen as appeasers uh, or pacifists. And that also affected Barack Obama very powerfully. Now, I think we're in a somewhat different moment, mm. um, but I do think many liberals feel that um, we we can't just deny that there are worse actors than the United States, Vla- such as Vladimir Putin. And in the absence of a working security architecture, there's no there's no um, power to do the work that's required in the face of evildoers like Putin, but the United States. So it's almost a sense of like regret and sorrow that prevails among liberals that they have to back neoconservative views, but they do so anyway. Now, there's another factor which I'd mention, which is that um, Russia is a territorially revisionist power. Like, it's taken other countries' land, which many liberals think is an incredibly atavistic thing, which simply shouldn't be allowed on principle. Um, Even though I think, you know, the Ukraine war and its origins was probably going to be about the kind of regime change that Americans themselves undertook in Iraq and Libya. Mm, yeah. uh, and it so looked like that there's in the beginning, that factor it? too. Yeah. It looked like that in the beginning, didn't it? That's look, it looks like that was what the plan was. And then it rapidly went off the rails. I, that's my take, but you know, others think that from the beginning, Putin was engaged in Imperial conquest. And so there's a certain number of liberals who think, After 1945, that's not allowed. War is allowed, American war. uh, But what America does is never take other people's land. And that's a red line that Putin shouldn't be allowed to cross. And of course, he did take Crimea. That was allowed. Uh, You know, if not, you know, formally, then in effect. It was sort of uh, and yet the, the the Ukraine war raised the prospect of really a return of territorial empire, which just, um, I think, led a, a number of liberals to say that's not something we can allow. And therefore, the United States has to be the power to stop it. So it's kind of a limited uh, a belief in intervention, uh, intervention under very certain circumstances. I think that's right. I don't think we're yet anywhere near a moment where you'd see the aggressive view that, well, 
democracy and, and human rights just require us to change governments around the world. No one's proposing that. And I don't think we're near the conditions in which liberals would be fooled, let's say, by the neoconservative call to, to proceed in that way. Is it your reading that, so my perspective on your views is that you believe the neocons uh, want to continue that project, but it sounds as if you're saying that what's holding them back is this liberal ideology, this the kind of the end result of the war in Iraq. I think that's right. I think that uh, like everyone, they're to some degree opportunistic and they understand that the sole conditions for their success is in building a coalition with liberals. That was always the case. Mm -hmm. uh, even when they controlled the government under George W. Bush, it was absolutely crucial for mainstream media, the new, not just the New Republic, but the New Yorker magazine to sign on to the Iraq war and for liberals uh, in almost unanimously to back the neoconservative cause. And so I think today neoconservatives recognize that liberals are not ready to embrace uh, American empire in the way that they once did uh, in effect in the Cold War and in the period after the Cold War for a long time, because they've seen where that leads, not just in Iraq, but in the war on terror, which many liberals themselves concede went too far, ha hasn't involved too many deaths with not enough justification. The reason I find this discussion so fascinating is because a lot of it turns on the way that the ideas are framed. So, for example, the idea of isolationism can also be called um, appeasement of people like Vladimir Putin. And it depends on how you perceive it that the public also then responds to it in a certain way. And I want to talk very specifically about the Republican Party and where you think the Republican Party might go, because this was our, the focus of our conversation with David French. Yes. Trump was the first major Republican to a politician to break with that neoconservative doctrine on Iraq. But I wonder if you think that that was more opportunistic or if he was genuinely leading the public to the party towards a what we might call isolationist, appeasing America first, some version of those arguments. So it's a great question. Um, I would start further back because what you notice is that since 2008, um, all victorious presidential candidates within their parties and in uh, in the general contest between parties have been against war. Uh, Barack Obama beat Hillary Clinton in 2008 in the Democratic nominating contest, largely f for that reason. Uh, Donald Trump first beat his fellow Republicans in the nominating contest eight years later by scandalously indicting the Iraq war, uh, which many people predicted would lead to his defeat, but just on the contrary, it led to his victory. And then he beat Hillary again. And so it seems as if there's lots of electoral legitimation in uh, opposing the Iraq war and, and maybe, you know, uh, interventionism more broadly. When Biden ran, he opposed endless war. I mean, he mm, helped, right. you know, yeah, piggyback yeah. on the use of that phrase that Donald Trump himself had tweeted about. Now, I do think that um, Trump is not an isolationist because he engaged in a lot of war. Um, yeah, yeah. But it 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 seems as if he recognizes that. Um, American people, um, at least for a time, had had were giving up on wars that didn't very clearly serve American interests, um, and that's why Donald Trump could uh, con continue to withdraw from Afghanistan, uh, and try to finish it, but wasn't allowed to do so by the so-called deep state, and Biden had to finish the job, even as Trump. Uh, engaged in his own escalation of the war on terror, which Americans accept. Um, 
uh, although liberals, you know, began to have more and more doubts given how reckless uh, Trump's version of it was. So I think it's an incredibly interesting moment. I think the mm. Republican Party has completely given up neoconservatism and and really no major force in the Republican Party anymore backs those sorts of ideas, which is why neocons for many years now have been reorienting to the Democratic Party, which is historically very interesting since neocons emerged from the Democratic Party and switched sides in 1980 because Ronald Reagan was willing to give them more access to power than the Democratic Party. And now they're switching back because it's clear that neocons can't influence the Republican Party for any foreseeable future, whereas they have a better chance among liberals. Do you see an interesting contest coming up between the ideas that Joe Biden is expounding in Ukraine and the potential ideas that Trump might in the Republican nomination. What I mean by that very specifically is I found it fascinating when Trump came on stage and said he would end the war in Ukraine within a day. That And, and at the same time, you have Joe Biden willing to expand the war to go to Ukraine and to go to Kiev and so on. And that seems to me to set up an interesting ideological conflict. And I wonder if you think, as we go through the, the next few months, that you will see Trump trying to drag the Republican Party away from the war in Ukraine in order to put distance between himself and Joe Biden. Oh, f- absolutely. And and I think o- other Republicans will, too. Ron DeSantis, who's seen as Trump's main rival and and likely and is the likely opponent of Joe Biden in the next presidential contest has also said that the Ukraine war is a mistake. And so we are seeing um, a in, 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 there's something new, hmm. which because for my lifetime, uh, the Republicans and Democrats have strongly overlapped uh, around um, interventionism and uh, the Republicans ha- are are abandoning it, um, at least in in some of its most obvious forms. And certainly, um, when it comes to alliances or like uh, democracy, human rights, but also general principles, like you know, some faraway place shouldn't be subject to uh, illegal aggression. Um, you know especially if it's Russian aggression. Well, you know, the Republicans are giving up that view almost entirely. And that's why those who are now refugees from that Republican Party who still believe in military intervention yeah. um, are have to look to the Democrats. And so there's, there's absolutely going to be a contest around that, um, that kind of, uh, that contrast. Line. Yeah. I mean, fascinating that 20 years on from the Iraq war, this is where we've ended up with the Democrats espousing foreign wars and the Republicans retreating uh, within America's borders. I think that's right. I think that, you know, one reason is that um, if if you're on my side, as you said, you're looking for complexity and you're not even I'm not willing to entirely rule out the uses of American power, although like I'm going much further than your average Democrat. Biden is somewhere on a spectrum of interventionism, you know, more willing to use American force clearly than someone like me, but Mm -hmm. uh, less willing than a lot of people and a lot of neocons would desire. And it's just simpler to say none uh, and mm. it's easier to sell that position to a, a fickle public uh, yeah. on Fox News. And so that one of the attractions of the isolationist views that the Republicans are you know, embracing is that they're simple. And uh, it's, it's, it, it is surprising on one level, but it was a very obvious move for them to make on another. I want to end by talking about invisible wars. Um, You made the point earlier that every one of the last three presidents have run on a platform of non-interventionism. But yet, American foreign policy has 
remained pretty stable throughout that time period from 2008. You still have Americans engaged in operations all over the world and American drones and all of the things that we talked about. So I wonder if perhaps we are overstating the consequence of these ideological questions, because whatever the mood music is ideologically, it sometimes feels as if interventionism, military interventionism by America just has inertia on its side. Of course, that's true. So um, I, 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 it's it's still hard to overstate the significance of a direct intervention when it it is chosen or pr proxy war of the Ukraine kind because it it does strengthen the hand of the interventionist party to have those kinds of policy choices to make. But you're right that it's against the background of something far more enduring and far more stable, which is what you know, Dwight Eisenhower and many leftists since have called the military industrial complex, which is that the Congress is every year spending more on weapons with a brief exception of the la the first few years after the Cold War. Um, and we're coming up to a trillion dollars annually that yeah. b people in both parties lay out. I mean, one of the most amazing events was uh, in the course of the first impeachment of Donald Trump, when the parties were allegedly at each other's throats, they took a break to 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 vote through the latest National Defense uh, Authorization Act at, right. you know, the highest levels in all time and not to be missed beyond those just that state allocation of funds to its own military is America's role in superintending the global arms trade, especially for the sake of its uh, of, of of the American welfare state, which is really um, through helping defense contractors make an extraordinary amount of money, not just from the United States government, but from most governments. So that's all now just normalcy. And if we were ever to challenge militarism, it couldn't just be these very fateful choices made about direct and proxy intervention by the United States, but really the militarism of the globe in the American era as a general proposition. What does all of that mean for your hopes of swinging the pendulum back towards restraint? Uh, I I think that there's, there's um, modest hope at this point, because uh, it is amazing that um, that Americans were evolving with me uh, over the last twenty years, and the fact that American presidents to be to gain power have to run against war is is a, a, an extraordinary starting point, um, and yet we haven't seen, with some exceptions, um, mu much. Uh, in the way of challenging um, the kind of neoconservative ideas, which are were, were gained such predominance in American life that they're just incredibly hard to banish, even when most Americans reject them. So there's hope, but it has to be modest at this point. I'm glad you brought up the the point about the Americans evolving with you, because I wanted to ask you finally a kind of personal question, because if you were on the side of the intervention in Kosovo at the time, 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, you were very much with the thrust of American politics. But as you say, America has evolved and it's evolved differently to you. You would probably be very much of an outsider now in American political life. Yes. I wonder how that makes you feel having started your um, your intellectual career with the prevailing winds and now being very much uh, on the outside. Well, I hope I, you know, can uh, feel that I've, I've learned some, some lessons. Uh, and if the price is marginality, it, they're still, it's, it, it, they're still worth learning. And then there's a certain amount of continuity because after all, those of us who came of age in the nineties, the reason we embraced American power was our cosmopolitanism. And it just turned out that uh, 
to be faithful to ourselves, we had to rescue that cosmopolitanism from our mistaken association of it with American power. And so if, if uh, uh, I'm no longer uh, as, as true a believer in my own country's um, nobility, it's because I remain interested in citizenship in the world, which is what cosmopolitanism means literally and in that sense i have a lot of allies they're just beyond the borders of my own country samuel moyne thank you very much thank you this has been the lead from new lines magazine you can find samuel on twitter at samuel moyne and find his latest book humane how the united states abandoned peace and reinvented war at all good bookshops this week's episode was produced by Joshua Martin and hosted by me, Faisal Yafai. For more like this, subscribe to The Lead on your favorite podcast app or visit our website, newlinesmag.com. Thank you.